welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. A little over a year and a half ago, I launched this show intending to tell the stories of trends, ideas, technologies, and ideologies that shape our modern world. The theme of the first season is nationalism, and in the introductory episode, I said I expected it to last for several episodes. Well, here we sit, after 44 episodes, not counting bonus episodes, and we've hardly even touched on nationalism in the modern sense. That's obviously a bit more than several episodes, and there are a ton of little threads and ideas that we've been following along the way. So, I wanted to take a minute to recalibrate, if you will. See, at the outset, I really thought that the season would be seven episodes, maybe ten, certainly no more than fifteen. Episode one... Echoes of Masada was about the Roman Jewish War and obviously predates modern nationalism. My intent was to illustrate the old imperial way of subjugating local peoples, and that even in an age where empires were the established way of doing things, certain people, like the Jews, already had what we would call a sense of national identity, or a sort of proto-nationalism. The original plan was to jump straight from Masada to the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia and the birth of something resembling the modern nation-state. Obviously, that didn't happen, and we ended up talking about all kinds of different stories. Mostly, it's because I got caught in a trap. See, we had this old imperial Roman system, and to jump forward to the Thirty Years' War is a bit jarring. Renaissance-era Europe looks nothing like the ancient Mediterranean world, so I wanted to trace out how we got from one to the other. So what ended up happening is that the ghost of Cardinal Richelieu, which was originally going to be episode 2, turned into episode 39. Part of this has been filling in the gaps, so to speak, right? I talked about the fall of the Roman Empire, the rise of Islam, and the division of the Mediterranean world into Christian and Islamic spheres. I talked about the Crusades and the European wars of religion, all of this to illustrate the changes in society over the course of 1,500 years. Another part of the reason that the season has gone on a little bit longer than I intended. Uh, well, this has been because uh, we have expanded our historical horizons beyond the Mediterranean basin and the European sphere. Right, we talked about the Ethiopian Empire and the Delhi Sultanate. I particularly enjoyed the last two episodes talking about Japan, which had a strikingly modern sense of nationhood, even while the Europeans were still fighting their wars of religion. So, what have we actually learned through all these historical meanderings? Well, after Masada, we spent the next seven episodes, episodes two through eight, discussing the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of medieval European feudalism and also the rise of Islam. We watched a unified Mediterranean empire get carved up between different barbarian tribes, and in many cases, legal authority fell from the old Roman administrators, or ducks, who would become uh, European dukes. Then, the Mediterranean basin became divided between Christianity and Islam, and at the same time, Mediterranean ideas, like monotheistic religion, would spread east across much of Asia, carried along by Islamic conquerors. In episodes 9 and 10, we took a historical detour to Serbia and talked about her struggle for independence from both the Ottoman and Austria-Hungarian empires. This was the story of a modern nation-state struggling to be born, and we'll talk about more of those kinds of cases in the next half of the season. Episodes 11 through 13 took us to Ethiopia, 
in a long story ranging from biblical times to the 1970s. This was the story of a nation that persevered against incredible odds and maintained its unique national identity even throughout the colonial period. It's a great example of how ancient legends and a shared history can form a united nation. Episode 14, The Battle of Castle Itter, is a one-off story of American and German soldiers fighting on the same side in World War II to protect a group of Allied prisoners from being slaughtered by the SS. This is a story of redemption, of how even when nationalism takes a dark turn, as it did with the Nazis, there are other good people waiting to take up their nation's mantle and make it into something better. In episodes 15 through 24, I talked about the Crusades, all of them. These stories have nothing to do with nationalism per se, but if you're going to understand the underlying drivers of religious nationalism in particular, uh, particularly the nuances of Western Christianity versus Eastern Christianity versus Islam, you really need to understand this period. Episodes 25 through 27 cover the Delhi Sultanate. This was one of many states in pre-modern India, and I'll probably cover one or two others before we talk about modern Indian nationalism later on. Episode 28 covers the Black Death, which, again, isn't directly related to nationalism, but it's important to understand the huge consequences it had for the annihilation and movement of peoples. In episodes 29 through 31, I talked about the Turkish conquest of the old Byzantine Empire and Mehmed the Conqueror's triumphant entry into Constantinople. These events are the historic, nearly mythic background to Turkish nationalism, even today. And they are important stories for other nationalists as well, like Greek nationalists. Episode 32 is another one-off. I talked about the Iberian Union, the marriage of Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon that formed modern-day Spain. This isn't just about Spanish national history. It's also an illustration of the dynastic and family dynamics that were so important to European politics at the time, and indeed more generally to world politics. Episodes 33 through 39 form more or less a united peace. These tell the story of the Protestant Reformation and the subsequent religious wars in Europe, which eventually turned into the Thirty Years' War, which was about traditional power politics, not religion. But it left us with the Peace of Westphalia, a set of treaties that acknowledged the territorial sovereignty of the various combatants, forming the basis of the modern nation-state. In episode 40, I talked about the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, better known as the Iroquois Confederacy. These people are one of many nations without their own state, but nonetheless with their own culture, language, history, and identity. Episodes 41 and 42 covered the early origins of Russia and its subsequent expansion across all of Siberia. In a show called Relevant History, this is particularly relevant. Between the time the two episodes aired, Russia actually invaded Ukraine, and Vladimir Putin's justification harkens back to some of the history of the Kievan Rus, which I covered here. Episodes 43 and 44 were all about the reestablishment of the Japanese Empire in the middle of the 1800s. This is a country that developed its own national identity no later than the early 1600s, with the shogun's order to limit contact with all outsiders. And in the 1800s, Japan struggles to modernize while modernization and liberalization clash with traditional Japanese values. 
So we've actually covered quite a lot. But most of this is what I would consider background to the idea of modern nationalism. It's the stuff you need to know beforehand before you learn about the rise of nationalism in its modern form. It's like the prologue sequence at the beginning of the first Lord of the Rings movie. Lots of information, but the main story hasn't even begun yet. See, when we talk about modern nationalism, we're normally but not always talking about a nation-state. A group of people called a nation are governed by a unified state that is made up primarily from people of that nation. This is important because not all states are nation states. Historically, most have not been. On the small end, you've seen a ton of city states, local areas with a few tens of thousands of people that are self-governing. The ancient cities of Athens and Sparta are prime examples. On the large end, you've seen a ton of empires. Vast areas governed from one central location, usually to the benefit of the conquerors. Take the Belgian Congo, for example. The Congo was populated almost entirely by local peoples, but... Their political leadership was Belgian and ruled the country for Belgian industrial interest, and that's how you ended up with a whole bunch of atrocities. In other words, the nation-state has two components, the people or nation and the government or state. The idea of the nation as a people is an idea that grew slowly over time. We've seen some inklings in it in some of our medieval and certainly the Renaissance era stories, but as we'll see in future episodes, it firmly takes root in the late 1700s and early 1800s, right? first in the American Revolution and then really coming to full bloom in the French Revolution, which spreads the ideas of citizenship and popular government throughout Europe and then via the influence of European colonizers throughout much of the globe. This 19th century version of nationalism is perhaps best expressed by the National Assembly of France in their 1789 Declaration on the Rights of Man, which states, quote, The principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. Unquote. Now, we were talking there in the French Revolutionary context, but this does not mean that a nation-state has to be democratic. Nazi Germany, for example, was super-nationalistic and also an authoritarian state. But the leader needs to demonstrate that they stand for the people of that nation or they're going to run into trouble. Take modern China, for example. Uh, Xi Jinping is the undisputed leader of the country, and most Westerners see him as essentially a dictator. But if his administration takes a wrong turn and the Chinese public sentiment turns against him, make no mistake the Chinese Politburo will yank him out of power in an instant. He has legitimacy only as long as the Chinese people see him as looking out for their interests. Broadly speaking, nationalism is a sense of unity, belonging to a larger group. But other than that, it can mean any number of things— I think this is one reason nationalism has gotten a bad rep in recent decades. After all, the Nazis were nationalists, and look what they did to Europe. Clearly, nationalism is terrible, but that's a simplistic view. No group of people will remain coherent if nobody believes in the group. The institutions can coast for a while... But ultimately, if the people of a country don't share any sense of unity, 
The state itself will become dysfunctional and fail, or it will get taken over by people like oligarchs who have a vested interest in its workings. Every nation-state needs nationalism in order to survive. Similarly, there's been a lot of moral judgment against nationalism. There's an idea that nationalism is somehow outdated or even outright bigoted. And I find this attitude often among Europeans, which is understandable, since Europe is a relatively small continent with a relatively large number of states that have a history of going to war with each other and getting a lot of people killed. So if you're looking at things from that perspective, maybe nationalism is a bad thing, but nationalism can also be a good thing. It can even be a good thing and a bad thing in the same context. Right? For example, the Russian justification for invading Ukraine is a nationalist one. Putin says that he wants to unify all the Russian-speaking people under one flag. But the Ukrainian resistance is also nationalistic. The Ukrainian people want to be self-governing, and they're willing to fight to defend that. If you don't have a nationalist sentiment in Ukraine, you don't have a resistance. You have a country that caves to the Russians within hours of the invasion. You have an army that just lays down their arms and goes home because nobody's motivated. You need nationalism. And let's not forget that the Russians could have justified their invasion on other grounds. For example, on bald imperial conquest. Nationalism is just one of many possible excuses. But the Ukrainian resistance can only be justified on nationalist grounds, right? The right of a people to self-determination, free from outside interference. Otherwise, why draw out the war and watch more people die? What are you fighting for? In addition to this, nationalism has also been negatively viewed because it can be used to justify oppression of certain groups within the state, right? minority groups. But there are many different bases for nationalism, not all of which can be twisted this way. Nationalism can be highly exclusive or surprisingly inclusive, depending on how it is implemented. On the most exclusive end, we have ethnic nationalism. Right? Nazism falls into this category, as do ethnic separatists in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Right? You're either born a part of the nation or you're not. And if you're not, you're always going to be an outsider. And if the nationalists come into power, then they might decide to do nasty things to you and your family. But there are broader definitions of nationalism that allow for more flexibility. For example, people can be of the same nation if they have a shared history. This is what had happened in many post-colonial governments. Going back to the Congo, there was no Congo prior to Belgian colonization. There was a collection of pre-colonial states and tribes. All of these people got colonized, all suffered the same atrocities, and all of them joined together to throw off the colonial yoke. That experience is shared by many previously separate peoples, and they become a nation. The same goes for many post-colonial states that fought for their independence. Language and religion are also common factors in national identity. These are somewhat exclusive, but not entirely. For example, you either speak English or you don't, but you can learn. These are things you can adopt to and assimilate uh, to join a nation. And depending on your values, you may not be comfortable with changing religion, but the point is these aren't immutable traits that a person cannot change. I'm not religious and I don't speak Arabic, but... If someone re-established the Islamic Caliphate tomorrow, I could theoretically learn Arabic, convert to Islam, and move there and be accepted as a citizen. 
Shared culture is another way to define nationalism, and it's probably the squishiest factor because culture is so hard to define. But it's also something that anybody can adopt if they want to. And being an American, I'll use an American example. I have a former co-worker who is a Polish immigrant, and it turns out that we are both big fans of the Philadelphia Eagles. For international listeners, that's an American football team. This guy came to the U.S. and started following American football, and let me tell you, he knows stats and details that most hardcore American fans like myself can't be bothered to learn or retain. You could put him on TV as a sports announcer and he'd fit right in. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can build a functioning state based on professional sporting teams, but I'm saying that if I were to move to the UK, I'd start following soccer and I'd learn to call it football. I'd start following a team like Manchester United, so I'd have something to talk about with my co-workers over the water cooler. I'd also make an effort to eat British food and watch more British TV. Now, that's obviously a very simplistic take on culture. There are more subtle things. For instance, the uh, Russian uh, and uh, more broadly Slavic uh, tendency not to smile uh, to strangers. It can come off as very off-putting if you're not uh, from the culture or you don't understand it. All right, these things are all squishy, like I said. But taken together, they help people to identify a group that they're a part of. Probably the most open form of nationalism is civic nationalism. And once again, I will rely on my American roots because this is the most prominent kind of nationalism in the U.S. Certainly, it's the only kind of nationalism that can unite a country as diverse as the U.S. And what I'm talking about is a shared faith in our public institutions. And in the U.S., we don't have an official language. English is the standard, but a significant percentage of people only speak Spanish. And there are many other languages spoken by a smaller number of people. We don't have a shared ethnicity. Far from it. Our history is colored by ethnic conflict and reconciliation. Religion? Forget about it. The U.S. was founded in part on the idea of religious freedom. And while there are certainly universal American cultural elements, like football... The U.S. is so large that you'll find all kinds of regional cultures throughout the country. If you want the best food, go to the Southeast. If you want the best art, go to the Northeast. If you want a freewheeling, do-what-you-like attitude, move to the West Coast. If you prefer a more conservative environment, stick to the South and Midwest. But we all share government institutions, a constitution, and a Bill of Rights that supposedly binds us together. The future will demonstrate whether this in itself is sufficient to unite over 300 million people. But I think it's an experiment that's worth trying. More to the point, there is no single defining aspect of nationalism. For every example, you can find a counterexample. We talk about linguistic nationalism. But Switzerland has been a nation for centuries, and they still speak German, Italian, or French, depending on where they live, and they mostly speak English in business situations. Ireland has long been split between Catholic and Protestant, but Sinn Féin just won the election in Northern Ireland, and despite their religious differences, Irish national unity is closer than ever. The Soviet Union was officially atheist. But after Stalin, Soviet propaganda cast the communist government as the defender of Orthodox Christianity and of the Islamic peoples in Central Asia to keep them safe from the corruption of Western culture. As far as ideology goes, people often misunderstand nationalism as a purely right-wing phenomenon. 
This idea dates back to the mid-20th century, when the Nazi Germans, Japanese Empire, and Italian fascists were indeed threatening the world with their expansionist, uh, nationalist ideologies. But this ignores the broader history of nationalism. Yes, Adolf Hitler was a nationalist, but so was Mahatma Gandhi. Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, who fought on opposite sides of the Chinese Civil War, were both nationalists. Joseph Stalin was a nationalist who believed in the idea of socialism in one country. So was Vladislaw Sikorsky, the Polish president in World War II who fought for his country's very existence. Nationalism can be tied to any political ideology. There are right-wing and left-wing nationalist movements. There are communist nationalists and capitalist nationalists. There are secular nationalists and religious nationalists. There's militarist nationalism and commercial nationalism. There's aggressive nationalism like we see with the Russians, and there's defensive nationalism like we see with the Swiss, who are neutral but armed to the teeth if you decide to mess with them. The only ideology I haven't seen attached to nationalism is anarchism. And, well, this makes sense because anarchists reject the idea of the state altogether, so why would they like it any better if it was established on a nationalist basis as opposed to some other basis? Point being, nationalism can be right-wing or left-wing or anywhere else on the spectrum. Any given nationalist movements might be good or bad, depending on your perspective, unless you object to the existence of the state altogether. The other major debate over nationalism is whether nationalism is intrinsic to a people or whether national identity is something that is constructed. And I have to admit, I fall into the latter camp. Obviously, some of these things like culture are organic, and obviously, people are tribal by our very nature. We tend to herd together in groups of like-minded people. But this kind of obscures the real roots of tribalism, which are prehistoric. Ancient people lived in small tribes, groups of around 150 to 200 people. And if they got bigger, the group would split because you can't have a hunter-gatherer group above a certain size without running out of food and also creating problematic social dynamics. See, 150 people is around the limit of the number of real personal relationships you can have. This size makes sense. You know everybody in your tribe, and so do all of your neighbors. This is a tight-knit community, and it's basically extended family, so everybody looks out for everyone else's interests. Before we even formed nations from there, we formed city-states and empires. In an empire, you don't know everyone in your state. You're part of a large enterprise that may or may not care about your interests. Even in a city-state of you know, twenty or 30,000 people, you may not have much in common at all with a large proportion of the population. In a national system, the situation is kind of similar, right? You don't know most of your fellow citizens. The U.S. has a population of more than 320 million people. Forget about knowing all of them. I don't even know a statistically significant sample of my fellow citizens. And psychologists tell us that even if I traveled the country and tried to form meaningful relationships with as many people as possible in as many places as possible... I would have very limited success. Remember, there's that 150-person limit on personal relationships. So it's impossible to truly know a statistically significant number of people in all but the tiniest of countries. In other words, tribalism is normal, and it's wired into every one of us. 
But nationalism is based on membership of a group that we only understand in theory. So, obviously, anything that unites people at anything beyond the extended family, tribal level, uh, it has to be constructed. This should be obvious. The most glaring example of a construction is a government, which is clearly a social construct. Do I pay my taxes to my local feudal lord, the regional imperial governor, a national tax authority? This is something people get together and sort out, or fight each other and sort out just as frequently. There's no way it could involve organically without being constructed. But if we're talking about nations being constructed as opposed to states being constructed, we also have to talk about things like language. And as it turns out, this is actually something you can construct. For example, like many European countries, France used to have many languages. In addition to French, many people spoke languages like Gascon, Occitan, and Breton, and other dialects. But in the early 1800s, Napoleon Bonaparte reestablished the French Academy with a charter to define the official version of the French language. Now, in the early 21st century, non-French speakers are rare in France. The only people who speak Gascon or Occitan are elderly folks whose language is in danger of being lost forever. So, even linguistic nationalism isn't always organic. I'll be keeping these things in mind as we proceed with the season, and I hope you do too. Nationalism means different things to different people. It can be used for aggressive war or for the defense of your homeland against invaders. It can be used to exclude people who are different or to include people who value the same institutions and rules. It's a feeling, like joy or sadness, like anger or fear, like patriotism or national shame, like aggression or defense of one's homeland. But no matter what it means, it's part of every modern society. And that's why it's relevant. Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course... Not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth, and if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up, and if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. 
or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.